not go where the path may lead, but instead go where there is no path and leave a trail. Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to a new episode of the Tears of Solitude with me, your host Ahmed Ali. Now, in this program, as we mentioned in the previous episodes, in this program, we seek to examine the life of each of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt by commemorating their tragic martyrdoms. In this episode, and as marks the seventh of the Hajjah, the martyrdom of our beloved fifth Imam, seventh infallible Imam Muhammad bin Ali al Baqar, peace and blessings be upon him. For this reason, I would like to send my condolences to all the Muslim communities, the Ahlul Bayt, our pious scholars, and the Imam of our time, may Allah hasten his reappearance for the martyrdom of such a very unique individual of Ahlul Bayt. Everybody may know that Imam Muhammad al-Baqir was born on the first of Rajab in the 57th year after Hijrah and died in the holy city of Medina on the seventh of the Hijjah in the 114th year after Hijrah. Our beloved fifth Imam is seen as the colossus of any Islamic knowledge and all the Islamic knowledge and is a source when it comes to the Islamic as well as the modern day sciences. A person whose life offers many lessons, especially in jurisprudence, theology, ethics, and philosophy. And if we want to discuss the life of Imam al-Baqir, which we inshallah go into further, but if one was to see that the life of Imam al-Baqir is often understudied, in the idea that if someone was asked about the holy Imam, the reply would simply be more on his father, Imam Zayn al-Abdeen. I personally compiled a survey to see, I went around asking the people around uh, the life of Imam al-Baqir and the majority of the answers were, we can say 70% or 80% of the answers were all about Imam's father, Imam Zain al-Abideen, or Imam's son, Imam al-Sadiq Now, and often when people tend to examine the life of Imam al-Sadiq they focus more on the establishments of Imam Sadiq Islam as being the founder of the first Shia school of thought. And that's 100% correct. But when we do find that it is often understudied is that they give more credit to Imam Sadiq Islam, which is 100% correct. But Imam al-Baqir was the one who introduced these theories and methods to Imam Sadiq. Hence, we find that Imam al-Baqir and just a note to mention, a very essential note that Imam al Sadiq spent 12 years under the guidance of his grandfather, Imam Zayn al Abdeen, and 19 years under the guidance of his father, Imam Muhammad al Baqir. So we do see the influence of Imam al Baqir and Imam al Sajjad on the life of Imam al Baqir. But this is often not mentioned when we discuss the life of Imam al Baqir. Hence, as I mentioned, the majority of the theories and the majority of the method, methods in Islamic laws were introduced by Imam al-Baqir to Imam al-Sadiq who took it to the further, uh, to a further step into establishing the first Shia school of thought. And unfortunately, some also tend to not know 
the role of Imam al-Baqir amongst the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt But if we want to analyze the life of Imam al-Baqir we find that the crystallization of the, the school of Ahl al-Bayt was during the time of Imam al-Baqir and was, was performed by Imam al-Baqir For this reason, there is a vital necessity on examining and analyzing the life of Imam al-Baqir for the fact that we should grasp all the lessons that we can from his life in regards to knowledge, wisdom. As I mentioned, he has various books and written in various fields of Islamic sciences, varying from theology to ethics to philosophy and all and jurisprudence and all the Islamic knowledges in the Islamic fields. As we mentioned, Imam Muhammad al uh, Imam Muhammad al Baqir, sorry, was born in the 57th year after Hijrah. Now, if we want to discuss the mother of Imam al-Baqir al -Baqir, alayhi salam, we see that his mother is Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, who is also given the title or kunya as Ummu Abdullah, the brother of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. But the mother of Imam al-Baqir is also a very unique person, which inshallah talk about. But Imam al-Baqir has something that no other Imam possesses and not from one side his grandfather is Imam al-Hussein and from the other side his grandfather is Imam al-Hassan so from both sides of the grandfathers he has an infallible Imam now no other than the Imams has this except for Imam al-Baqir now if we want to go to Fatima his mother the daughter of Imam al-Hassan the mother of Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. We find that she is also distinguished from the other ladies, from all the ladies of Ahlul Bayt because she is known for her wisdom, for her knowledge and her beauty to the point where even Imam al-Hasan salam gives her the title al-Siddiqa. This title was only given to our beloved Lady Fatima and Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her and her father Prophet Muhammad which continued, this title continued through Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. Now, some may wonder, what's the meaning behind Siddiqa? In the Arabic language, Siddiqa means truthful. And according to many traditionalists and many historians, they have stated that Fatima, the daughter of Imam al-Hasan, was known as the most truthful lady during her time. One of the most truthful ladies during her time according to many occasions that were presented to her. Now, if we want to look at the life of Imam al-Baqir we find that Imam al-Baqir grew up under very an extreme circumstances. The government back then materialized all their human and financial powers to initiate wars, horrific wars that deviated the Muslims from the knowledge of Ahl al-Bayt and from the Islamic knowledges which resulted in huge disasters and huge casualties. Now, we mentioned that he is born in the 57th year after Hijrah. And honestly, that time was at the end of Muawiyah's reign. Now, Muawiyah was the person who persecuted and killed the majority of Imam Ali's companions and some of Rasulullah's companions and the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. And when Muawiyah died, the people at that time thought that the government was going to be handed over to Imam al Hussein as, the, as according to the treaty that Muawiyah and Imam al Hassan wrote. But what happened? The opposite happened. Muawiyah appointed his son Yazid, and he wrote in his will to Yazid that if you want to succeed in your government, you have to do one thing, which is take the allegiance of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and if he does not, behead him. So this is the first the establishment of you know, uh, the heir to uh, Muawiyah. May Allah curse him and curse his son. This is when we hear the famous lines of Imam Hussain alayhi salam saying, a man like me cannot pledge allegiance to a man like Yazid, an alcoholic, a murderer, someone who lowered the name of Islam and deviated the Muslims from the actual teachings of Islam. This is the words of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. But when the Battle of Karbala began, 
And when Imam Hussein alayhi salam died and was butchered in the land of Karbala, Imam, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam was only three years old at that time. I mean, being three years old and witnessing what happened in Karbala, Imam al-Baqir was sitting in the tent of his father, Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, and had to witness his aunt Zainab, Ruqayya, Sukaina, Umm Kulthum, Ar-Rabab, all the women and children of Ahl al-Bayt salam, running from one tent to the other to try and rescue all the children of Ahl al-Bayt salam, due to the fire that was lit in their tents. And even, we go even further to read that Imam al-Baqir himself had to run so he does not get trampled on by the horses. So we find that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam only at the age of three and had to go through such circumstances. I mean, at the age of three, one would expect warmth, love, compassion, comfort from the atmosphere surrounding him. But we see that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam at the age of three, still a child, yet he had to go through all of this. So we find that, and also, it wasn't that just what happened in Karbala. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam had to face and witness the oppressions which came after Karbala. I mean, imagine a three-year-old being cuffed with shackles along to Ruqayya and Sakina and the other children of Ahl al-Bayt and were taken from Karbala to Kufa and from Kufa to Sham. Now, in Sham, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, as traditionalists have provided us with, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, in Sham, spoke his first words of wisdom and his first words of knowledge. When the caravan of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, the ladies and the heads came into Yazid, he looked at the ladies and the women of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam, and he said the women are to be sold as slave women and the rest to be killed. The whole room went into silence because no one other than Yazid has done this up to this point. Now, all of a sudden they hear a voice speaking. Oh Yazid, when Pharaoh was in power and he arrested Moses and Aaron, he at least gave the people the chance to elaborate and to contribute to the judgment for Moses and Aaron. And the judgment was to cast them away to a far distance. Yet you have no respect for the family of Rasulullah, the one who brought this religion. Yazid looked around, he said, who said this? All of a sudden they see a three-year-old saying this and trying to refute the judgment of the Caliph of that time. May Allah curse him, Yazid. So we see the Imam at such a young age was able to refute the judgment. Now between us, who at the age of three can bring information such as Imam al-Baqir when he asked about, when Yazid asked about this child's name, they said it was Muhammad. But yet no one, they thought he was just like any ordinary Muhammad. But no, this was the Imam. And they realized that this little young boy was not talking out of ignorance or something that he has heard. No, he mentioned the whole story. Yazid was shocked. I mean, who at the age of three knows that Pharaoh caught Moses and Aaron and the judgment that went on and comparing it with the judgment of the false ruler at that time. So we do see the Imam presenting extraordinary knowledge and extraordinary wisdom at such a young age. Therefore, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, and as I mentioned, at a very young age, had to go such through such hardships and through such difficulties that no other child in history has gone through. But inshallah, we'll continue the story, but after the short break, so stay tuned.
viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, once again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the second part of tonight's episode. Now before the break, we talked about the circumstances which Imam al-Baqir had to go through and had to face at such a young age. And we left off at the events happening in Sham. After they returned to Medina and after the demise and the martyrdom of our beloved fourth Imam, Imam Zayn Abdin alayhi salam, Imam al-Baqir took the responsibilities and the affairs of the Shia. However, in Medina, there was a person waiting for our fifth Imam. And that person had a message from Rasulullah, peace be upon him and his purified progeny himself. It wasn't transferred to him, no. Rasulullah gave him that message to convey to our fifth Imam. Who was that person? It was Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari, the oldest companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam, the only survivor from the companions of the Holy Prophet. So the Holy, Holy Prophet one time told Jabir, he said, O oh Jabir, you will have a long life, and although you will go blind in your old age, but you will meet the fifth Imam from my descendants, from the progeny of Rasulullah. So as predicted by the Prophet, and he said, send him my salams. So as predicted by the Holy Prophet wasallam, Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari had a very long life, and he did go blind in his old age. But every day, Jabir would go out of his house and sit in front of his house on the street and wait for that moment when he will meet that Imam, the fifth Imam. One day, Rasulullah told him in that message and told him, he says, he will have the same walk as I and he will possess the same, the same merits and characteristics I possessed. So one day Jabir was sitting along the road and a man, someone came by walking to Jabir. He recognized the style of walk. Automatically, Jabir stood up and stopped that person. He says, please give me your name. This person said, Muhammad. Jabir felt something in his heart. He says, son of who? He says, son of Hussein, son of uh, Ali ibn Hussein. Right away, he fell to his knees, went in tears and started kissing the Imam's hands and conveyed his salam to Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Imam al-Baqir told Jabir, took Jabir and went to his home. He told the people and the companions of uh, Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Baqir told them to get everyone, as much people as they can, to the Imam's house. When everyone arrived, Imam told Jabir to narrate the story once again. He narrated the story and they all cried together and confirmed to the Imam of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and also mentioned the, seventh, the seven Imams coming after Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. So we find that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, when he was in Medina, he was given that freedom. Now someone, some people would say, where was that freedom coming from? You know, all the Imams were persecuted. After the demise of Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, the fourth Imam, in the, fifth, in the 95th year after Hijrah, the Umayyad government began to shake because people knew what, the, uh, what Yazid did in Karbala, the tragedy of Karbala, what Yazid did in Mecca and what Yazid did in Medina. So they began to realize what was going on from tragedies and from afflictions. So this created the space for the Imam to disseminate the knowledge of his grandfather, Prophet Muhammad and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. So our fifth Imam established schools where he taught jurisprudence, where he taught exegesis of the Holy Quran, and where he taught various fields of Islamic sciences. And he encouraged especially the youth to be educated at that time because if you, as a youth, if you're regularly used to something, when you grow up, it'll become a habit. So Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam always encouraged the youth to always focus on, you know, nourishing their souls, educating themselves. And that's why Imam al-Baqir's main target 
where the youth, where the elders also joined his classes to learn. But one of the students that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam had is Abu Hanifa, which inshallah talk about tomorrow. And the situation between and the relationship between Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam and Abu Hanifa. But with all this being said, one question still remains is that many people ask the question we always call the imam al-baqir al-baqir they wonder where al-baqir or what al-baqir means according to the arabic language al-baqir is a derivative from the original word baqara it means to split to expand to go through knowledge and deep down to its core this is what Al-Baqir means. Now, according to the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, he's the one that gives the title of each Imam. So Imam Al-Baqir was given by Prophet Muhammad. Now, we go to name that, why did Imam Al-Baqir given the title? Why was he given the title Al-Baqir? Is because any sort of information and any sort of knowledge that came through the Imam or came across the Imam Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam would examine it and analyze it to its core. Another title that he was given is that Baqir al nabiyin the one who split the knowledge of the prophets. Now, the knowledge of any ordinary person, an imam may know, but the knowledge of the prophets, some may begin to wonder. And sometimes us Shia, the Twelvers, get criticized for such information. But to us, the followers of Ahl Bayt we believe, according to Prophet Muhammad, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated, that the Ahl Bayt have been given a higher rank than the other Prophets. And Imam al Baqir was given that title because he even disseminated the knowledge of the Prophets and cut through and split that knowledge to its core and analyzed it. One time, a man came to Imam al Baqir, I would like to conclude with this short story. One time, a man came to Imam al-Baqir and he asked him, did your grandfather Rasulullah, or was he the heir to the knowledge of the prophets before him? The reply came, yes. The Imam then was asked whether Prophet Muhammad inherited that knowledge. The Imam also said yes. Then that person asked, could he raise the dead? Could he cure the blind? And could he cleanse the leper? Imam al-Baqir looked at that man and said, By the will of Allah, nothing is impossible for us, Ahlul Bayt There was a blind person sitting near Imam al-Baqir He put his hand, Imam al-Baqir raised his hand, and put it on this blind man's eyes and began to pray. All of a sudden, this person began or his sight, his eyesight was returned to him. Everyone sitting down testified to the Imamah of Imam al-Baqir Hence, at the, end of the, at the end of tonight's episode, I would like to emphasize on one key point, is that we should always try to analyze the lives of each of the Imams, especially the life of Imam al-Baqir Because the, the knowledge and the wisdom that he disseminated to us, and the knowledge that we have today, according to Islamic knowledge, was all presented by Imam al-Baqir So I would like to thank you very much for tuning in tonight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue shedding His mercy and blessings upon all the lovers of Ahlul Bayt. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.